It's good to know what the chart says. So good afternoon. I just want to start with an update on the latest COVID-19 public health metrics. Yesterday, the Department of Public Health reported, Department of Public Health reported over 86,000 new COVID-19 tests and around 1,700 new cases. The seven-day average for the positivity rate is 1.9%, and there are about 18,000 total active cases right now in Massachusetts. As we all know, we've seen an uptick in cases in recent weeks, which is something public health officials expected and that we're responding to with a number of tools. In a minute, I'll talk a little more about the targeted interventions taking effect today. The Department of Public Health's daily report also reports that just under 500 confirmed COVID patients are in the hospital in Massachusetts, and of those, 115 are in the ICU. And there are 23 newly reported deaths among confirmed cases. As most people know, on Monday, our administration announced a series of targeted actions in response to the increase in new cases of COVID-19 and a rise in hospitalizations statewide. Since Labor Day, new cases have increased by about 300%, and over the same time period, hospitalizations for COVID-19 have increased by about 145%. This is a worrisome trend. I think we all understand that. Our biggest concern, of course, is that hospitals risk getting overwhelmed, and Massachusetts risks not having the life-saving medical care for all services that people need available when we need it. We certainly have a ton of resources and data available to fight COVID-19 that we didn't have in the spring. We lead the nation in testing. We have advanced tracing and surveillance capabilities, and we have stockpiles of medical gear that will last through calendar 2021. And we all know what it takes to kill the virus. Well, the virus rages across our communities last spring. People in Massachusetts responded and we fought it back successfully. People heeded the guidance of public health experts and they did what they needed to do to slow the spread. We need everybody to do that again so we don't have to take drastic measures going forward. To help in this effort, effective at 12.01 a.m. earlier today, the Department of Public Health issued a new stay-at-home advisory from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. I signed an executive order that will require indoor recreation facilities, theaters, casinos, and many other entertainment venues to close at 9.30. Restaurants must seat and serve customers by 9.30 and close by 10. I've also updated the gathering order to reduce the gathering limit in private residences to 10 people for indoor gatherings and 25 people for outdoor gatherings and finally, I signed an updated face covering order as well. We know, we know we're asking a lot here, and it comes on top of asking a lot of employers and residents for many months now. But the virus, as we've said before, isn't going anywhere, and until there's a vaccine or a medical breakthrough, it's us against the virus. We believe that taken together, these targeted measures, the stay-at-home advisory in place at 10 a.m., 10 p.m., excuse me, everyone doing their part to be vigilant, we can, in fact, stop this increase in positive cases and hospitalizations and flatten that trend. And we need to do so now so that we can keep our schools open and keep our economy running. Last spring, as everybody knows, before we had much scientific data about how the virus affected kids in schools, we were forced to order schools to close in-person operations. At this point, there is clear and convincing scientific data that shows children are at significantly less risk of developing serious health issues from exposure to COVID-19, and there is clear and convincing scientific data that shows learning in a classroom, as long as people are playing by the rules, does not lead to higher transmission rates. And as I said, and as I've said before, the data on this one is clear. Recently, researchers at Brown University released the first set of findings from a new national COVID-19 school response data dashboard. It found extremely low levels of infection among students and teachers across the country. Even in communities where rates were rising, COVID-19 rates were rising, schools were not the source of transmission. 
comprehensive epidemiological studies from countries around the world show that schools can open and operate safely. Data collected from school districts across the U.S., of which we now have several months' worth, show schools can open and operate safely in person. And right here in Massachusetts, in just about every community, with the safety measures we've put in place and our local uh, colleagues have responded to, the data pretty much says the same thing, that schools can open safely. There are more than 450,000 public school students across the Commonwealth that are back in their classrooms each week. And so far, the number of COVID cut cases statewide is extremely low. Over 28,000 students have been learning in 84 Catholic schools in person since August, and they're currently reporting less than 40 confirmed cases of COVID-19. These schools are located in many cases in cities, and some have among the highest transmission rates in their communities in the Commonwealth. In the most week recent weekly report released to be released later today by the Massachusetts K Department of Elementary and Secondary Education concerning K through 12 public schools, there were 252 confirmed positive cases of COVID among students and staff. That's out of 450,000 students they're doing some form of in-person learning every week. The number of cases has actually dropped from the previous week. When DESE initially released its school reopening guidance back at the end of June, it was developed in conjunction with pediatricians and public health experts and based on the best available data at the time. There's a lot that's changed since then and we need to act accordingly. We continue to see too many communities with children learning in remote only models. Not being in school poses significant risks for kids, both related to COVID and related to other health concerns, like depression, anxiety, and others. In Rhode Island, students learning remotely tested positive at a higher rate than students attending classes. Some people mistakenly believe that we can just wait this out and then send our kids back to school when there's a, virus, a vaccine or treatments. But we all know that losing a week, a month, a quarter or more in the life of a kid's education has real consequences. And that's why today we're improving our methods for assessing transmission rates in communities and upgrading school guidance to reflect what the data now makes clear, that learning can happen safely in the classroom. The updated metrics are consistent with metrics that are in place in surrounding states and take into account far more data than we did before. Since day one, we've said that our decisions would be guided by public health data, and these two improvements are a product of new and better information that's now available. There's no one-size-fits-all approach for communities when it comes to this pandemic, but our goal is to use the best information available to help our schools put their students' well-being first and make the best choices for students, faculty, and staff. Parents helping kids learn at home have been through a lot, Children separated from their teachers who care deeply about them have also been through a lot. And teachers and school administrators have been doing their absolute best to make this all work. And I'm confident that with these new resources and information, school districts can bring more kids back to the classroom and vastly improve their educational experience. And with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Mary Lou Sutters. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. As our knowledge about COVID deepens, so does our response, including the data that is analyzed and reported publicly. Earlier this week, as the Governor said, the daily dashboard was updated, providing new information on the impact of the virus. The first page of the deck provides one place for the public to quickly access current COVID-19 data about cases, testing, hospitalization numbers, and tragically deaths. Starting in August, we began publishing weekly municipal level data and color-coded communities based upon a population adjusted 14 day average daily case rate. Thresholds were established based on the trends we were seeing at the time. Since we set the original metrics, testing in Massachusetts has more than doubled, making a single case-based metric less reflective of the overall picture. Also in August, most of our cases were attributed to specific high-risk communities. 
Today, smaller communities with a small number of cases are contributing to our case count in a meaningful way. Similar to the rest of the country, we're also seeing increased COVID cases across many communities, not just in select hotspots. Local officials have used these metrics to make decisions about schools, businesses, and to understand what's going on locally. But as I have said before, our understanding of the virus continues to evolve. Studies have shown that there's low transmission in schools, even in communities where there are high rates of COVID. Using one metric to determine school reopenings, community by community, does not reflect our current understanding of the virus that there is more transmission due to increased cases of COVID. We've seen other states use more refined metrics to determine school and business reopenings as well. This includes using population as a factor versus only cases per 100,000. We've spent time reviewing what other states use as metrics, as well as what is available on the academic and national data sets. Today, we are updating our municipal level metrics. The new metric is informed by data used around the country, including other states in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic region, in terms of how to best define the spread of the virus at this time. Over the past three months, we've received feedback from municipalities that the thresholds should perhaps be more nuanced. We've heard from some that a few cases within a couple of days in a small community can cause them to move between risk designations quickly, or that specific clusters should be called out. We've also heard that conduct from some communities that conduct significant testing, that a matrix that takes into consideration the percent positivity rate should be added. So our updated metrics adjust for the reporting of cases by a municipality's population size. These metrics incorporate cases per 100,000 residents and the percent positivity rate when determining a municip municipality's color designation. Under the revised methodology, the municipal color-coded designations are, that will be reported later today, 16 red, 91 yellow, 79 green, and 165 gray. The new Massachusetts thresholds are generally in line with New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey, although our metrics take into account community population differences. Our metrics, our thresholds are slightly more conservative than Illinois and the Harvard Global Health Institute's recommendations. We are significantly more conservative than New Hampshire and slightly less conservative than California and consistent with the World Health Organization's advice to use a 5% test positivity rate or lower. This metric will continue to be used to determine whether a community is in step one of phase three or step two. Communities currently in step one of phase three will need to have three weeks of data where the community is designated yellow, green, or gray in order to move to the next phase. Providing municipal level data to local officials about COVID-19 infection rates is critical to making informed decisions about businesses, keeping our kids in schools, and understanding what is going on locally. Today, we know that the source of most of the infections in the Commonwealth are households private gatherings, church gatherings, carpooling, settings where people let their guard down among people they're familiar with. We all must do our part to stop the spread of COVID-19. Avoid gatherings with people outside your household. Wash your hands often. Stay home if feeling ill. Wear a mask in public. With Thanksgiving coming, please remember that many people with COVID are asymptomatic particularly younger individuals, are less likely to exhibit, exhibit symptoms than older individuals. It's a difficult choice, but choosing to host a virtual Thanksgiving could save a life. One other update I'd like to share. Earlier today, the Department of Public Health announced $3.4 million in grants to programs in central and western Massachusetts that provide community-level behavioral health services to middle school students at risk of behavioral health issues including substance use, mental health, or conduct disorders. As Secretary Pizer and Commissioner Riley will detail in a moment, this has been a difficult time for many students, especially those with challenges. These grants provide additional support at a critical time. And with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Pizer. Thank you, Secretary Sutters, and good afternoon. 
Last summer, after extensive consultation with doctors, infectious disease experts, and public health officials, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education provided school districts with detailed guidance on how to plan for safely delivering in-person instruction this fall. Although districts were asked to develop multiple strategies in anticipation of changing circumstances throughout the school year, Commissioner Riley expressly directed every district to place a priority on maximizing in-person instruction. Educators, students, and parents all agree that even under favorable circumstances, remote learning is a second best option that should only be used as a last resort. In addition to learning loss, the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as many other doctors, researchers, educators, report that the absence of school is causing or exacerbating significant challenges for children and families related to mental health, food insecurity, and social and emotional development. Being out of school during the day can create opportunities for COVID spread as well, as too many children are unsupervised or allowed to congregate freely together. All of these challenges are especially acute for younger children, students with disabilities, and other high-need children who desperately need access to support services and daily routines that only school, in-person school, can provide. Based on the research and track record the governor has described, and after further consultation with our medical advisors and public health experts, we are clarifying and updating our guidance for schools. <clears throat> Specifically, districts are now expected to prioritize in-person learning across all color-coded uh, categories, unless there is suspected in-school transmission. As always, districts and schools must strictly adhere to all health and safety protocols outlined in DESE's guidance, including social distancing in classrooms of at least three feet. Any uh, and any clusters that occur as a result of in-school transmission must be addressed quickly, including, if necessary, temporarily shutting down individual classrooms, or in the worst case, whole schools where clusters have actually occurred. Schools experiencing clusters will be provided access with the state's rapid response mobile testing resources in order to mitigate the spread. Districts and schools and communities designated as gray, green, or yellow are expected to have students learning fully in person if logistically feasible. A hybrid model should be used only if there is no other way to meet health and safety requirements related to school buildings or transportation. Schools in red communities should consider implementing hybrid models instead of going fully remote while minimizing remote learning time for younger and high need students. In those few communities with the highest COVID cases and test positivity rates, DESE and the Department of Public Health will work with local school officials to develop and implement customized strategies to reduce in-school health, re health risks and to enable as many children as possible to attend school. We owe a deep debt of gratitude to all the child care providers, teachers, paraprofessionals, nurses, social workers, principals, superintendents, food service staff, maintenance crews, and of course parents who are working tirelessly to ensure our students of every age continue to be cared for and educated under incredibly difficult and challenging circumstances. But we have to do better. Otherwise, we will create much deeper educational and developmental gaps between students and communities, which for many young people may never fully be closed. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education, Jeff Riley. Good afternoon. At the core of our responsibility as a state education agency is the well-being of our students, their teachers and support staff, and of course our families. We remain committed to keeping our students and educators safe while providing all students with equitable, high-quality learning opportunities, even in the face of the pandemic. Most students, families, and schools have responded positively to the return to in-person learning. And while remote learning has improved since the spring, we know nothing can take the place of in-person instruction. We also know the harmful effects of children not being in school. Despite facing challenges, school leaders who are conducting in-person instruction, either full-time or in hybrid models, overwhelmingly report that the planning, safety measures, and training they implemented to open the school year are working. As in other states and countries, Massachusetts schools have experienced relatively low positivity rates compared to their communities. 
Districts have carefully implemented safety protocols developed by DESI and DPH in consultation with our medical experts, and these appear to have had a significant positive effect on safety for staff and students. We continue to stand up additional measures to mitigate virus spread in schools. As you know, DESI and DPH are providing rapid mobile testing for schools that may experience a cluster of positive cases. In addition, Massachusetts will receive Abbott Binex Now tests from the federal government, some of which will be used in public school districts, charters, and other educational settings. Together with DPH, we are introducing the first phase of these tests this month with an initial group of schools and districts. This is a voluntary initiative with test kits provided to schools at no cost, de designed to help schools continue to offer in-person learning. Under federal guidelines at this time, the Abbott Binex Now test is not to be used for broad-scale asymptomatic testing in schools, only with symptomatic folks. Through our local experience, as well as the emerging med medical literature on reopening schools across the world, the time to get kids back to school is now. It has become increasingly clear that this virus is going to be with us for a while. We have created ways to safely return to school through our extensive health and safety guidance, new opportunities for COVID testing, and our DESI Rapid Response Help Center for districts. With these measures in place and evidence that schools can operate safely for in-person learning, we need to continue to work hard to get as many students back to learning in school buildings as possible. I would like to thank the thousands of teachers, school administrators, paraprofessionals, and other school staff, families, and of course our superintendents, all of whom working day and night on behalf of our children. None of this would be possible without you. We know that this is not easy work, but our focus must be on what's best for the children of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and we feel strongly that this is the getting them back to school, and now is the time to do that. With that said, it's my privilege to turn it over to Dr. Mary Beth Miodo, the Vice President of the Massachusetts Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Miodo. Good afternoon, Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, Secretary Pizer, Secretary Sutters, and Commissioner Riley. Thank you for inviting me to here today and for working alongside pediatricians to bring children and educators back to school using evidence-based practices to minimize the risk of infection and other serious health problems. The Massachusetts chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics represents over 1,600 pediatricians across the state dedicated to the health and well-being of children. The objective of a public health response to a crisis is to methodically gather more and better data to guide improved and targeted inventions, interventions. Our chapter supported the state's school reopening guidance in June, and we've monitored data from across the state and nation to see how community transmission and in-school transmission may be related. We believe that the governor's announcement today will help school districts and local boards of health create COVID plans that are more relevant to transmission in their specific populations at any point in time. More nuanced data will allow the safer school health planning that we need, including the ability to potentially pause in-person learning in the event of small outbreaks, or to potentially return more children to school on a full-time or hybrid basis. Pediatricians have worked with school nurses, superintendents, and school committees to keep children and school staff safe during reopening. There are countless success stories of districts that reopened with full and hybrid models. Families, schools, and community leaders have responded nimbly to small numbers of cases. Every district faces its own challenges. Dedicated educators, including those who are currently re teaching remotely, have had to make hard choices. I have collaborated closely with school nurses and school-based health centers professionally who reach out beyond the walls of the school to create medical neighborhoods for their students, even during remote learning. In this phase of the pandemic, what pediatricians have been seeing in offices, hospital emergency rooms, and intensive care units is telling a second story. While all of us, especially those of us who have personally lost family members to COVID-19, are acutely aware of the virus's risks, the health risks of remote learning in children and youth are becoming very evident to us every day. I practice in Worcester, and we've had different levels of community transmission, yellow and red, and my patients haven't been able to return to in-person learning yet. And I'm seeing very disturbing trends. 
I've, beginning, I've been begun to hand out jump ropes in my annual well child visits because my school age patients have gained 20 pounds or more in just the time of the pandemic. They're sitting for long periods of time with limited physical activity and may not be getting high nutrition, highly nutritious meals. The long-term consequences of rapid weight gain and sedentary lifestyles will certainly be seen for years to come. Another sobering narrative on mental health is being revealed. Uh, last week, I heard yet again from a pediatric intensive care specialist who told me that their hospital census is consistently reflecting more hospitalizations for youth suicide attempts than pediatric COVID cases. What's so concerning is that many of these kids with so suicidal thoughts and attempts don't have a history of behavioral health problems. They're typical children bending or breaking under the stress of the pandemic and specifically from being alone for long hours at the computer. Many children struggle academically, but schools aren't just about learning. Schools are places to find trusted adults. Schools are where school nurses help manage chronic diseases like diabetes or asthma. Schools are places where children get extra healthy meals when food is scarce at home. And schools are places where friendships and mentoring provide safe havens for growing youth to establish healthy identities and ride out tough new emotions with the support of caring, experienced adults. We cannot downplay the risk of infection, but youth who attend school and who are reminded gently to wear masks, socially distance, and wash their hands may actually be much safer from viral transmission in school than when unsupervised in the community. Data has shown that school transmission is generally lower or equal to community transmission due to this strict school hygiene measures. In fact, since we have districts on remote, hybrid, and full return to school right here in Massachusetts, Tracking data shows that viral transmission rates are not lower in either students or teachers working and learning remotely. Pediatricians are encouraged by the improved availability of detailed data on community and school COVID transmission and the potential to use this new approach to keep adults and children safe at school. Our chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics welcomes improvements in strategies to prevent acute infection, and we're equally determined to prevent chronic negative health outcomes in children and youth. Thank you. Okay. There's not a lot of transmission among students, but is there? What's the chance that they may be asymptomatic and bring the virus home to their families? The data in general uh, shows that the transmission between students or younger people um, to adults is lower than vice versa. Um, so there is always a chance, just as in the community, that could happen. But we're not seeing, when we do contact tracing, we're not seeing large numbers of students um, doing that to the teachers. And in fact, for instance, in my district, we're hearing about teachers getting infected, but they're getting infection at home. Doctor, can you, um, I don't know if any of your patients are um, students who have done in-person learning, but can you speak to the impact that um, some students might have um, when they're doing in-person learning, but then they have to go remote after a COVID case has been reported? What, is there some sort of mental or emotional whiplash that comes with that, or how do you, you know, what impact do you see? You know, we have actually heard, um, and, and I talked to different people about whether the change um, that parents and, and students would have if they went in and out of school would be detrimental. Uh, I will tell you, so my public school district has not has been fully remote, um, but we do have Catholic schools and private schools, as well as um, a collaborative of special ed schools in our community. And I have seen some of those families um, report that they did perfectly fine. You know, I think that's what we can do. We'll get better at doing if we take these short pauses and they come home for a week, no different if um, they have a week off in other circumstances and they bring their laptops home and then they come back. And so in general, the families I have who have had those schools that were in person um, or hybrid have been doing very well. Parents are very happy. Uh, do they consider the childcare and other issues um, if they 
have to come home, sure. I mean, they're parents and they have to, to work. But overall, I've heard very good things and I haven't seen any negative outcomes. Is there any sort of um, difference in ages of children, high school versus the younger set, in terms of the effect of being remote? So I have not, I'll be honest, seen a lot of specific studies. Um, anecdotally, it looks like the preschool, the pre-K, and the kindergarten are really suffering being at home. It's very difficult as well. I mean, we all think of our kindergarten teachers. Those, those are real troopers. And yet it's very difficult when really hands-on learning is very helpful um, for those kids. And those kids also often need literally one-to-one -one help on their iPads or their Chromebooks um, at home. And that's really difficult for the families. Um, so... Overall, if, especially with th those children who we've seen daycare and childcare data being very um, positive about sending kids back to, to pre-K and early childhood um, centers, if we can bring those kids back as quickly as possible, that will be really helpful. Again, for the learning, for that friendship, the social skills. Dr. Well, I will tell you that Mary Lou Sutter is probably better, Commissioner Sutter, at that than I am. I am very aware of it, and it, it is part of a strat, sort of a, a stage testing plan, which I love to have different levels of testing. Um, I myself have two children who are who one is just out of K through 12, just started in college, and one in grad school in both of those schools um, after doing initial. Uh, individual testing, started doing pool testing, and it's been very um, positive, but I think that that's part of a full testing array, and the more we do, the better. Um, so I applaud anybody who can use science to help bring our kids back to school. Let's put it that way. Thank you. Other questions that are sort of on this topic for other people? Could you speak to what? We're seeing school districts shut down suddenly if there's word of a party and there's concern that the virus might spread, so they're sending everybody home, even if they're hybrid or whatnot, for 10 days, 14 days. Is that the right approach? So, um, Marblehead, I think, was one of the communities that um, shut down for two weeks, mostly because they had no idea who was actually at the party and no idea who might be. Infected, who should be quarantined as a close contact. Adam went through the same drill. Um, I think the, the answer on that one is uh, I think local communities need to make their own call with respect to how they want to play that. Um, I have heard, as the doctor said, from um, other people I know who are in districts where people have gone remote for a week or two and then come back because of something that happened in the community. Um, the, the disruption was nowhere near as severe as it's been for people who literally have just not seen their friends or been in class for an extended period of time. Um, I, I think the, you know, my view based on, and again, my information on this one's more anecdotal than anything else, is if your goal here is to serve kids in person or serve kids um, on a hybrid basis and you come across something that creates a circumstance or a situation, that you feel requires to go remote for a week or two, I think that's a far better outcome than just saying we're gonna stay remote, um, even if the data supports spending time in class. So if a community was in red, based on the old system, and they're not in red when we get the update back today, do they still have to close some stuff if they took a step back based on the old metrics? The, um, I think what Mary Lou said in her remarks was that um, if you were red and you're no longer red, if you're not red for three weeks, which is the way we set this up from the beginning for three reporting periods, then you can go ahead and move to, to step two. Or so, yeah, to step two. What are the penalties for school districts who don't, that don't uh, you know, follow these rules and, and instead opt to continue remote learning or staying hybrid if they don't qualify for hybrid learning? I think the, um, the goal here from the beginning, and this works within the state framework generally, and I'll have Commissioner Riley um, 
respond to this too. Uh, the goal, generally speaking, in Massachusetts is the state sets standards, provides guidance, and provides resources and, and measures performance. But the decision about what actually happens on the ground in each community is a decision that gets made at the community level. Our view is we've put a lot of guidance in place. We've worked with our colleagues in the pediatric and public health community to develop it. We put a lot of federal and state resources on the table to give communities the ability to finance some of the investments they needed to make to choose whichever plan they chose. Um, and this is another example based on a growing body of evidence that says that schools are not spreaders. And in some cases, there's even data that suggests that schools are, kids are safer if they're going to school than they are if they're staying home. And, uh, and I think it's going to be up to uh, folks at the level, local level to make the call with respect to how they want to respond to that. So Do you want to speak to this, Commissioner? You know, I think what the governor said is accurate. At the department, we have a responsibility and obligation to um, make sure that folks are following the guidance to the greatest extent possible. And if people start deviating it, certainly we'll address that individually, but we do also respect what happens locally. So if uh, a school district decides uh, they want to remain remote until February just as a precaution, there's no penalty or anything that they would face at this point? So right now we'll address that with each individual. I don't want to speak about hypotheticals, but we'll certainly, based on our track record in the past, we'll address when we feel that uh, people aren't following state guidance. Commissioner? Yep. Are you saying that communities and school districts in gray, green, and yellow should absolutely be going full-time in person? Yeah, I think we're prioritizing, we're asking districts to prioritize getting our kids back. Um, we recognize there are some health and safety metrics um, that people have to follow, and that could, in theory, drop people down to hybrid or keep them in hybrid, but to the greatest extent possible, we want to get as many kids back in school as we can. In a lot of communities, one of the harder groups or audiences to convince seems to be the teacher unions. Because how, how do you get past that? They, they have somewhat resisted out of concern yeah, I mean, I think we want to be respectful of the teachers' union, but we also want to, um, you know, base all of our decisions based on science and the best medical advice, right? And so our job is to come up here and make sure that um, we're doing best by our kids. And right now, the medical advice and what we've seen both across the world, across the country, and even here in Massachusetts is we need to try to get our kids back to school to the greatest extent possible. Last question. Governor, uh, I, wonder, I wonder if, if you could answer this by blending the cases per 100,000 and the positive test rate, it seems to throw two together now that you have to top. And you're testing so much more that, I don't know if that's a really accurate measure of the spread in the community. So if you look at um, a lot of the data that's out there across the country, one of the main ways um, the public and states and the federal government keep score with respect to how states are doing generally, is um, cases per 100,000, right? Which is where we started right. back in August. Um, but some of these national scoreboards also measure how much you're actually testing on a per capita basis and how much you're testing relative to the number of cases you have per 100,000, right? Now, we're testing more often than not, somewhere in the vicinity of 150 to 200 percent of what would be the appropriate level of testing given our population and our number of cases per 100,000. There are a lot of other states that are testing in the 50 percent, 60 percent. In other words, about a third as much as we are. They have the same number of uh, cases per 100,000 that we have, and if you look at us nationally, we're testing at about half of what a lot of these scoreboards think we should be testing at. But we heard from many communities, and we heard from our folks, our colleagues in New York, who are using a positive test rate as one of their measures for making a decision about this, was you don't want to tell a community not to test as much as they possibly can. Because finding cases and contact tracing and helping people support themselves in isolation is a better answer always than not doing the testing because you don't want to raise your total cases per 100,000. The goal of this was to basically say, 
If you test and you test aggressively and you find cases, there are limits to which you will move from green to yellow. But we want you to, we don't want you not to test to find cases and we want to give you credit if you're testing a lot for the fact that your positive test rate is reasonably low. If it's not low, based on the World Health Organization standards, you go above 4% or you go above 5% and you hit that number, you're going to land right. But I don't want people not testing. I want people to test. I want people to feel incentivized to test. I want people to think testing is a good thing. I mean, one of the things uh, Secretary Sutter's talked about was we've doubled our testing on a per capita basis over the course of the past 10 weeks, 12 weeks. That's a good thing. And, you know, going forward, don't be surprised if we increase it again. But it seems like you're... You're, you've just changed the rules to reduce the number of red communities, in a way. We incorporated more metrics into this. I mean, to have, to have the same metric for a community of less than 10,000 people than you have with somebody over 50,000, these communities, if they had, under our old one-size-fits-all metric, if these folks had a handful of cases, two families, they'd be yellow. If they had three families, they'd be red. That hardly represents what you see. But if you took out the positive here, test rate, it wouldn't shift that quite a bit? The reason we didn't use a positive test rate in these places is because they're so small to begin with. Well, I guess I'm not. I, I happen to think this is a more nuanced and more accurate way to test how communities are doing, not just in terms of their cases per 100,000, but how they're doing with respect to testing practices and policies, and we want communities to test. I don't want some community to say, I'm not going to test because I'm worried about increasing my numbers. I want people to test. Governor, so, uh, the, 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 the election, uh, what's your reaction to President Trump saying he's the victim of a wide-ranging nationwide conspiracy? Well, first of all, um, right now you have Democrats and Republicans across a number of states counting votes. I support that. We should count every vote. And we are counting votes on a bipartisan basis. Georgia's counting votes. Pennsylvania's counting votes. Pennsylvania has a Republican House and a Republican Senate and a Democrat governor. Georgia has a Republican governor, a Republican House, a Republican Senate, a Republican Secretary of State. Arizona has a Republican governor, Democrat House, and I think a Republican Senate. Bipartisan basis, the states that are still counting votes, Republicans and Democrats counting votes. That's a really good thing. They should count the votes based on whatever the rules are in each of those states. Second, there are certainly processes and rules and laws and regulations about recounts. If states pursue those under those processes, rules, and laws, perfectly appropriate. And there are courts in which these things can get addressed based on the laws as they currently stand in many of those states. If the courts end up getting involved, I hope they move quickly based on the facts, the processes, and the law. But at some point, at some point, you know, we're in like the seventh or eighth inning of this game. At some point, Everybody's got to get used to the idea that we need to move forward as a country and deal with all of the significant issues that we have to deal with here. And finally, um, I think the President's comments that there's some national conspiracy around this aren't supported by any of the facts. And they are damaging to democracy, they cheapen all of those of us who serve in public life and who ran and who were either elected or defeated based on the will of the people. And our, I've, I've been in a bunch of close elections, so have you. The rules are there. And, you know, almost every state in the country went through a major overhaul of the way they handled voting after the presidential election in 2000. People really did take a good hard look at the rules, the processes, and the administrative procedures that they all had in place across the country. And we need to count all the votes and recognize 
I, I haven't heard anybody say much at all about the fact that we had the highest participation rate in our nation's history in this election. We should be celebrating this. People took it seriously, they came out, and they voted. That's a good thing. Are the president's comments counterproductive to trying to bring this country back together after what has gone on? I think the, um, I think the vast majority, as I said, I think the vast majority of those of us that are in public life, that participate in electoral politics, believe in and support the process. And as I also said in my remarks, you got Democrats who are involved in these recounts and you have Republicans who are involved in recounts. In some cases, you have both involved in the recounts in many of the states that are going through this process. And I think suggesting that this is somehow um, a conspiracy, uh, it's just bad for democracy and, and cheapens all the work and all the efforts that so many people took uh, to make sure that they voted and that they would be able to believe that their vote mattered and counted. Thank you. The House filed a budget yesterday. Do you think they'll meet your deadline? Do you have a stand-by? The National Guard? Yeah. Yeah, how much longer do you think you'll have them on stand-by? Until local communities tell us that we should send them home.